In these times of uncertainty, it's all the more important that we keep collaborating, informing and inspiring each other so that we can be smarter and better tomorrow. Welcome to the Pakhuis de Zeiger livecast. Good evening and welcome to the special live cast featuring the Trust in Play European School of Urban Game Design. Uh, my name is Martijn de Waal and uh, together with my colleague Gabrielle Ferry, I was one of the organizers of the Amsterdam branch of the uh, Trust in Play European School of Urban Game Design. What exactly that is, I will tell you a little bit more about in a minute. But first, what are we going to do tonight? Tonight we will talk about urban games. What are urban games? How do you design them? And also very important, what can they mean for urban culture? Can urban games be a new way of activating public space, bringing out trust relations between citizens? How are we going to answer those questions? Well, we have three really uh, exciting and interesting projects for you. Because in the past year, eight participants took part in the Amsterdam branch uh, of Trust in Play. And together, they've worked uh, towards the creation of three games. And tonight, I'm going to talk with uh, three representatives of these teams. They will show their games, and we will discuss them uh, and go into depth uh, about how those games uh, are made and uh, what the mechanics and the dynamics of those games were. Um, we will start with that in a minute, but before we do that, let me tell you a little bit more about the European School of Urban Game Design. What is that? Well, the a Trust in Play program uh, was an initiative uh, from Maria Saridaki and Sebastian Kwak, together with the Goethe Institute in Athens. Uh, Maria and Sebastian, they're both part of a scene of urban game designers, people who over the last 10 years or so have started to come together in places across Europe to make urban games at festivals, cultural events, or uh, as artistic interventions in, in public spaces. And uh, while they were doing that and they were meeting up each other informally uh, for, uh, for a while, they thought it would be a good idea to take games and play a bit more serious and see if they could set up uh, an actual cultural program around it uh, with the goal of training new urban game designers and exploring more into depth what urban game design is. Um, those are important questions uh, because urban game design is, uh, is a difficult discipline because uh, you need a lot of different expertises. You need people who have expertise in public space uh, with a background in architecture. You may need people who have knowledge of game mechanics. You may need people who have knowledge of placemaking, uh, how you can involve uh, local communities. You may need people who know how to code and make apps uh, that can be used for the urban games. Um, how do you bring all those people together? How can they start working together and design urban games? That was one of the questions that we wanted to address uh, in the training school. Now, urban games are not completely new, of course. They've been around for uh, at least half a century. In uh, Paris, for instance, in the 1960s, the Situationists started to stage urban games uh, in reaction to what they thought was the commercialization of public space uh, in those times and the society of the spectacle. Um, on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean in the, U in, the, uh, in the United States, there was the New Games Movement, who also started to stage all kinds of playful interventions in public space and the goal of these uh, initiatives back then but also uh, of the initiative that we're talking about today was really to forge new social relations between people how can games do that how can they bring out new trust relations in cities and we've tried to explore that over the past year but of course that was rather challenging because when we were in the middle of a program, um, a COVID outbreak started to happen. This happened, uh, as you all remember very well, probably in mid-March. That was exactly the moment when uh, we, with the participants in the Amsterdam branch, were at the moment where we were going to move from concepting to actual playtesting and having our games in public space. Now. The COVID situation, of course, made that more difficult because what are urban games about? They are about often strangers uh, uh, yeah, interacting in public space. And all of a sudden, that didn't seem like such a good idea uh, anymore. 
Um, so that brought out a new challenge. Huh? How do we also play games in, in these days? And again, we still use urban games to activate public spaces. These are the questions that we're going to talk about, and we're going to move to our first game. Um, the first game uh, is the game Wonder. It's made by Lily Higgins and Joanna Lupuasku, and um, they've made a movie to introduce the game that I would like to show to you. somewhere to hide. What makes a good hiding spot? Do you think those neighbors are friends? How do they greet each other in the morning? Walk in the direction that looks the ugliest. What makes something beautiful to you? was an introduction of the game Wonder by uh, Lily and Joanna. Uh, Lily, welcome to the studio. Uh, glad that you are, uh, are here. Um, I think the film gave uh, a really a great impression of the game, uh, which is really sort of a fun way to, on the one hand, experience the city in a new way, but also, yeah, in, involve yourself in a relationship with, with somebody else that you may or may not know yet uh, mm -hmm. through uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the mechanics that you've designed. Can you tell us a bit more about um, yeah, how, how this game was conceived. Yeah, um, well, my collaborator, Joanna and I, uh, we conceived this game sort of the day after the COVID crisis sort of became like real in everyone's reality. Um, and we, like you said, we had just finished our concept for our previous game, which we had been developing with the program for a few months. Um, and we realized that the game we had been developing just wasn't really going to work anymore in this new reality. Um, so we really took inspiration from these new rules of social distancing. And we thought, well, how can these new rules actually become rules of this game and become an interesting mechanic that we can actually play with? Uh, so to kind of take away the heaviness of this social distancing and even exaggerate it. So not 1.5 meters, but actually walk 15 meters apart. So what, yeah, how does that change your dynamic? Yeah, um, you brought some photos. Maybe you can uh, uh, walk us through uh, the photos a little bit to give us a bit of an idea uh, how one would experience the game, right? So um, I think this is the, uh, the first picture. What, what happens here? Yeah, so earlier this summer, Joanna and I um, staged Wander as an event, actually. So we uh, brought together people who were interested in playing the game um, on some custom-made picnic blankets that allowed people to sit one and a half meters apart and meet each other before they started playing the game together. Um, so the game can be played either uh, as an event that we facilitate, but it can also just be played uh, you know, with your neighbor or your friend or your partner uh, anytime you want with the help of this uh, Wander playbook, yeah. which you can... And there's the, the blankets have two colors. So what do they stand for? 
Um, they stand for the Wanderer and the Wanderer. So the game has uh, two roles. The Wanderer with an A is the person who walks in front of the Wanderer with an O. And the, the Wanderer with an O um, is curious about the person walking in front of them. So they're wan wondering about sort of the life and the experience of the person walking in front of them. And that's how you play the game, is you walk sort of not facing each other through the city. Um, and you don't look each other in the eyes. And that really brings about this new kind of intimacy of having yeah, a conversation. So it's two people, one walks ahead, the other walks behind them, and they're, they're connected through their phones, right? So yes. the people, the person who's behind can give instructions to the people who's walking in front of him or her. Um, and can you say a bit more about those, those instructions? Uh, you made a little book, you already showed it. Yes. Uh, what kind of instructions do the wanderers give to the wanderers? So this, uh, the Wonder Playbook is a kind of like um, all the instructions you need to play the game and also a selection of prompts that you could use while playing the game. Um, and a lot of them focus on kind of our sensory experience of the city. So for example, close your eyes and feel the wind on your face. Walk towards the direction that it's blowing. So that might be an interesting way to, you know, change your path. In, through the city. But there's other questions that um, ask you more to reflect on how you, how the city evokes memories or how it evokes feelings. Um, so it's really a game for passionate conversationists, which Joanna and I both are, and we really did sort of design after our own love for having these kind of stream of consciousness conversations with people. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a very lightly structured game. Um, and very improvisational. Yeah. And what I find interesting, there is a bit of an interplay because the questions, they usually uh, start with sort of a factual question, like describe what you see, what mm -hmm. is there, what's on your left, what's on your right. And then it's followed by a more subjective question, right? Which sort of evokes a particular memory or a feeling and, and people start, uh, start talking about that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Do people have to follow the rules that are in the book? Uh, they don't. Well, there's some very basic rules about how you're supposed to walk and switch roles, which we do advise that you follow because those are kind of the only rules. Um, but as far as the prompts go, actually most people don't even look in the booklet while they're playing the game. This is sort of almost like a pre-briefing of the game to see like, oh, well, what are the possibilities? Um, but usually when you're walking through the city, the city has so many things to react on that you, there's no like, um, there's no difficulty to find inspiration from what's on the street and sort of react on it and ask like, oh, you know, what, is, what about that color of that passing car? Does that remind you of anything? Yeah, right. So the book, and that's what we're seeing here. People sort of go through it when they're when they're starting, but then mm -hmm. they use it more as an inspiration. Or if you're super stuck, you can pull it out of your pocket and kind of flip through and say like, oh, that would be nice in this spot. Yeah, yeah. But uh, they they also uh, improvise, uh, asking new questions. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's what we're what we see. What are we seeing here? Uh, we're seeing here, um, as part of the event, sort of the first uh, leaving the safety of the park where everyone started on the picnic blankets. And uh, Laura here is sort of looking in the booklet, I think, and familiarizing herself with the types of prompts that are in it. Um, no. And uh, you can see in the back, like really fuzzy, is her partner. So that's how far apart they're walking. Right. Right, right. So the, the person in the, on the back can see the person in the front, but the person who's walking ahead does not really see uh, no. the wanderer. No. And the, the, one of the main rules is that you're not supposed to look each other in the eyes. Um, and this really gives uh, almost an anonymity to the game, kind of like the feeling of describing your life story to a stranger. Uh, and this game is also very interesting to play with strangers. Um, and this, uh, this photo is really a nice moment captured because um, there's two roles in the game and you can switch roles at any time. So uh, both players get to play the role of the wanderer and the wonder. And this moment uh, is when the wanderer, the person who's walking in front, abruptly turns around to face the other player and it always surprises them. So um, the person uh, in the yellow is surprising 
um, the person in the white by switching roles with her. Right, and you can do that any any time. Mm -hmm. uh, so it and as many times as you and want. As many times as you want. So the right. game stays quite dynamic in its kind of flow. Yeah. Um, here's another slide from from one of your uh, playtests. What happens here? Um, so this is uh, what you could call like the dare mode of the game. Um, you can play the game in a few different ways and something that a lot of players really like is to dare each other to do things. So as the wanderer, the person walking behind, you can ask uh, the other player to do whatever you want. So you could say, um, go into a shop, buy me a coffee, leave it on the street where I can find it. And in this photo, uh, the wanderer has asked the wanderer to try to climb on top of the apples, which she's not quite managing to do, but she's giving it a go. Right. Uh, what other kind of uh, uh, examples of dare have you seen with people playing the game? Um, I've heard of uh, one person asking another person to go into a record store and pick out a record and kind of narrate that process because the shop was very small. So one player stayed outside on the street and the other player went inside and sort of browsed all the records. Um, and when you saw in the video, um, these two guys who were at the event, they sort of played dare mode all the way through the game. And they were constantly like daring each other, like climb on top of the, on the tree, like climb on top of the digger. Um, yeah, so I think it's really interesting that it, it allows for different player types to kind of, yeah, go the full, uh, yeah, really dive into it in their own way. Because yeah. what, what other modes of playing did you see emerge when people started to do it? Um, so we sort of pinpointed that there are three main modes of play. There's the dare, <laughs> um, but there's also the deep conversation, which the game, I would say, originated more from, um, which is more like using elements that you observe in the city to get to know the other person. So the goal is really like, figuring out about the person's life or how they experience certain things. Um, but a mode that kind of can also overlay those two is a pervasive mode. And I already kind of mentioned that with, for example, going in to get a coffee, um, where the game actually can kind of bleed into, into life. You could play the game for 24 hours and uh, go to a restaurant together, but sit at different tables and not look at each other. You could go to a movie. There's nothing in the rules that say you can't do those things. Um, so I'm really curious to sort of also play the game myself in this more kind of radical, pervasive way um, to experience like how long can you play the game and what are all the ways that you can make it fit into your actual life. And what kind of uh, reactions did you get from the players? What did they like about it, the game? Um, well, I mentioned this, but uh, players really liked the intimacy of the game. Um, this mechanic or this dynamic of not looking in each other's eyes is actually really powerful. Usually, uh, there's a lot of examples of nice workshops where you do actually just stare into each other's eyes, and that's a way of empathizing. But in this game, it's the complete opposite, that somehow you feel safe to kind of share and go deeper into your experiences and your reflections and your emotions and your history um, when you're not looking into each other's eyes. Uh, so we heard that sort of over and over again, that it, um, it allowed strangers, like for example, at the event, there were many pairs who did not know each other at all. So they were able to play the game and sort of really connect with each other. Right, and that's uh, in a way that's also how it relates to the to the game of trust. Uh, trust, right? It sort of brings out this trust relation. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, that I would say that relation is also a bit precarious uh, because um, there is this sense of playing versus being played with, right? Because you're mm -hmm. following the instructions from somebody that you don't know. Exactly. How do people experience that? Um, I think it creates a really interesting tension in the game um, because there is someone who's essentially playing puppet master to you. And um, I think it, it requires a lot of trust for the wanderer, the person walking in front who's receiving the instructions to kind of let go into that mode. Uh, or it, it sort of trust that the person who uh, they're playing with is really uh, 
yeah, playing together with them and not playing them in a way. Um, but consent is also a really big part of this. And uh, there's also in the booklet uh, a note about that there's always an opportunity to say, hey, I'd rather not do that. Um, so that's, yeah, I think it's a really interesting dynamic that arises. Yeah, great. Um, what's next, Lily? Uh, I can imagine people watching that they're really enthused and now they want to play the game. I hope um, so. How can they do that? Well, you can ask Yuan and I to organize an event for you uh, to gather a group of friends or strangers to play Wander in a park with our beautiful picnic blankets. Um, or you can just play the game yourself with your friends or uh, a first date you've been wanting to go on or a neighbor you've been wanting to get to know better. And um, if you go to my website, which is listed in the event location uh, information, you can download uh, a copy of the Wander Playbook. And okay. You can play yourself. Great. Well, thank you so much, Lily, and also Joanna, for designing this beautiful game. Thank you for sharing your insight uh, with us. Uh, this was Wonder. And then we're going to move on to our next game, um, and that is the game Snake City. And uh, Snake City is a game that was made by three other participants in the Trust uh, in Play a European School of Urban Game Design, uh, Julia Galtieri, Gavin Wood, and uh, Tomo Kihara. And uh, also they made a movie introducing their project. <laughs> So on stage with me now is uh, Tomo Kuihara. Tomo, welcome. Uh, glad you could join us here. Um, maybe just we just saw the movie, but maybe you can just briefly explain the game because the game is actually very simple, right? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's super simple. So Snake City is a game that is like a physical multiplayer game, which asks people to connect with their phones physically. And it's a game about like how long you can connect with like how many people. And yeah, it's it's really simple as that. Yeah, that's 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 really it. That's also the beauty of it. We'll talk a, a little bit more about that later on. But first, I want to ask you if you can tell me a little bit about um, the design process itself. Mm -hmm. uh, your team was three very different people: right. one with a background in computer games, uh, you're yourself more sort of a uh, art, design, mm -hmm. coding background, and then Julia has more of a placemaking background. Mm -hmm. How did those expertises come together in the way that you designed the game? Right. So, yeah, we all came from very different backgrounds. Um, I guess like what tied us together was our like shared interest in how we can open up like urban spaces for play. And that's where like our aligned interest was. And I guess like one of the initial questions we had um, for the Snake City was like this notion of like this physical connection with strangers. And Another th another theme we were really thinking is like we noticed that like when it, even when it, when we are in the same space like when we are like using our phones we tend to be connected with like somebody entirely different so we kind of took that as like an inspiration and saw like what if we can actually literally use our phones to connect like physically with others and like kind of bind them to that spot um, so that can, kind of became the initial inspiration for the like, Snake City. And then we kind of moved on from there. Right. Uh, you also brought some pictures of the making mm -hmm. process. Um, oh. uh, what are we looking <laughs> at here? <laughs> okay. So, oh, I shouldn't. Okay. So this is like an initial sketch that we kind of envisioned. Um, it was very like rough and like, and <laughs> so we Im initially we imagined like this huge game where like you connect with other people and on the map, like the number of people who are connected is like visible. So we sort of imagined um, that to be, it, it to be somewhat of like a Niantic game, to be a bit like English, where you see like what's happening on the map, 
obviously that didn't happen, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> this was the last sketch. Well, yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> you seem a little bit embarrassed by showing this picture, but I think it's really great yeah, because okay. I think all design processes, actually that's how they start, right? right? You course, start yeah. by sort of uh, sketching these really funny, funny pictures. Mm -hmm. um, here are some more pictures. And uh, I don't know what struck me when I look at those pictures is you guys had an awful lot of fun, right, working together. Yes. Yeah, we had a lot of fun developing yeah. this game. At yeah. the same time, I think uh, people working uh, from three different backgrounds, that must also lead to some conflicts, right? And sort of different ways of seeing the world. Mm -hmm. Can you give an example of that? Yeah. Um, hmm. So I guess like, yeah, there were like um, conflicts and also maybe due to the fact that like we all were sitting in separate like locations um, yeah, it was sometimes difficult to envision um, the gameplay because there was, especially during like April and May, like it, there was really no point, like no way to actually game test the whole thing. Um, so that was quite hard. But I think like um, Gavin, who had more experience in like game de development, really guided us to like uh, making sure like we are on track and that really helped a lot. I yeah. think. Yeah. What I what I was actually trying to get at is sort of mm. how um, how do the sort of the different disciplines that come together how do they see the world different and sort of approach mm. the design w in a different way. Right. Did you experience that or, or yeah. not at all? Yeah. I think like um, Julia has a lot sees a lot of things from like how as you mentioned like more from like a place making side while I try to see it more from this how to create this really interesting bodily interaction and Gavin really tries to see see it as how to make it into this really interesting game so I wouldn't say it conflicted I would say that it was a really nice like merger of all like different perspectives into this one concrete experience. Right. Um, let's move from the process to mm -hmm. the game itself. Right. Um, on the website, uh, you mentioned some sources of inspiration. Mm -hmm. uh, Bounden from Adrian de Jong, for yes. instance, also a Japanese uh, platform game. Uh, Nobi Nobi Boy, if yeah. I pronounce it right. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a bit more of how those games inspired you? And of course, those are uh, computer games or apps, mm -hmm. and you turn those into an urban con context. So right. what did you take from that, and how did you translate that into an urban experience? Yeah, we were really inspired by the game Bounden, and during like the initial playtests, um, we were like really looking at. Maybe, what kind maybe of can you just briefly explain that game? Oh yeah, Bounden. Like, so Bounden is a game by the Game Woven, um, which is like a game a bit really similar to like Snake City, where two players connect with one phone and they like move according to the instructions on the screen, and that kind of forms a dance, and that really inspired us like during the game process designing the game and to convert that to the urban context we really focused on the the availability of the game so that's why it's like a web game where if you just access it or uh, access the link snake city you can like immediately jump in while like making it as like an app would like ask people to download it which kind of hinders the whole like experience of the just jumping in so yeah, like we really took inspiration from the games like Bounden. Um, we tried to be, like make it really more friendly for anybody to just like jump in from anywhere. Right. And uh, hey, you already showed, uh, showed the website. Maybe you can show it again because yep. it's, it's really quite easy. Um, if you look at the website um, and you press play, you have a screen and you have two buttons and mm -hmm. uh, we could almost play it now, right? Yeah, we can. Um, we can. So we're one and a half meters apart, so we're not exactly going to um, make it right now, but in theory so, we could. Yeah. Starts new game, and so I'm now yeah. connecting here. Well, let's see if I can make it. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Yes. Okay, now, and what happens oh, is wait. No, oh. Yeah. All right. Let's go. And what <laughs> happens is that uh, uh, the only thing that really happens is a counter that yes. starts counting, counting time. Right. Sort of a very simple uh, concept. Mm -hmm. um, I find it very interesting because if you look at uh, at urban game design uh, uh, from from sort of a bit of a distance, you see sort of a wide spectrum. Sort of on the one hand, you can design experiences that are completely scripted, right? Almost like a theatrical experience where people mm -hmm. have roles and maybe even lines that they have right. to say out, etc., uh, and all kinds of props. And at the other side of the spectrum, you have basically objects with affordances and no right. rules, like uh, like a ball. You can mm -hmm. give somebody a ball and they can sort of play whatever they want uh, with it. How did you how did you sort of approach that? Eh? Obviously, you're sort of very much uh, on this side of the scale. Mm -hmm. uh, why did you make that decision? 
Yeah, so we made that decision. Um, I, I think you made a really good point on like, um, the, like I, I also see this really wide perspective of like the game kind of games in this like field. Um, really wanted to keep it simple so that like it has room for other people to like make rules on top of. So in a in a sense, like it's almost like a game prop, where. Um, you are free to invent your own kind of games with. And I think like that's maybe also the beauty, also combined with the fact that this whole game is like open sourced, meaning that anybody can build the, their own version of like Snake City. Um, yeah, yeah let's, let's get to that in a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, you say, uh, because the, the only rule is uh, connect yeah. and the timer starts, and then um, you can sort of make up your own rules, like do you want to make the snake as long as possible? Do you want to make the duration as long as possible? Maybe people come up with some other interpretations. What kind of interpretations have you seen when, um, uh, when people were playtesting it? Yeah, so like I shared the link to several several of my friends, and one of them came up with this very interesting concept of like do not let go of your hands game, where you don't really connect with others, but you just use the Snake City interface as a way to make make sure your hand is almost like tied together, like in a handcuff, and the first one to let go like loses. It's as simple as that, but like that's a very entire different game from right. the ones we imagine. Uh, Lily would say uh, that's their mode, right? Sort of yeah, trying to, um, <laughs> uh, uh, um, to do that. Um, maybe a last question. You already mentioned that. I mean, the, the game itself is, is very open in that people can sort of appropriate it in all, all kinds of ways. But also the code is open, sort of the underlying code. Uh, it can be downloaded from GitHub. Yeah. Um, that means that you can also use that code to make very different types of yes. games, of applications. Um, what did you, what do you imagine there that could happen? Yeah, so it, I think like the uh, applications are endless. We built it in a way so that like you can style it into any kind of games. So I can see ranging from like a real time questionnaire game to maybe some kind of like an instrument where like multiple people play together. But I think there's like a lot of opportunities where people can just um, play on. Okay, so that is then, I guess, an open invitation to everybody who's watching. Yeah. Uh, Tomo, if they want to do that, they go to? Snakecity.com. Snakecity.com or oh, snake.city. Snake 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 yeah, yeah. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Tomo, for, uh, for introducing the game to us. Um, and uh, thank you to the, to the whole team of Snake City. And then we're going to move to our third game, and the third game is um, Allee Normaal. Uh, Allee Normaal, uh, title in Dutch, but uh, the crew is, uh, is completely uh, English and uh, another language uh, speaking, but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, the team is Olina Terzi, Vitor Freire and Viviana Cordero, and they've made uh, Allee Normaal. And uh, I'd like to invite uh, Olina to join me on the stage. Hello, Olina. Hello. How are you? Hi. Good, very, very excited to be here and speaking about these nice games. Yeah, tell me, um, you have a ba background as an architect. Um, uh, wh why, did you, why did you join? Why did you sign up for the, the, the uh, a School of Urban Game Design? Um, so, of course, coming from an architecture background, I had this interest in public space, uh, place, place making as well, uh, but also very much on the social aspect of cities, so communities, interactions in public space, the, these changing dynamics. And also nowadays with the rise of technologies, uh, the field of smart cities, um, all these augmented kind of uh, uh, versions of the city. Um, I think that we have, as architects, the responsibility to understand the city both in its physical form, but also in its digital twin, let's say. Um, so I really wanted to to discover this different kind of interactions that we can um, create. Right, right. Sort yeah. of moving from just making the building and the objects in space to also becoming an orchestrator of the experiences yeah. that take place in those spaces. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and somebody that you said there, uh, I find interesting because you said uh, we as architects were not on the only persons who are making cities anymore, uh, if you ever were. But uh, uh, as of for the last five or ten years, uh, big tech companies have also yeah. uh, 
become a bigger player in, in how we experience our cities yeah. through smart cities. Um, that has also become the theme of the game um, that you made. Uh, you also made a movie. Maybe you want to introduce it briefly. What are we going to see? Yes. Uh, so you will watch an interaction of uh, an artificial intelligence agent um, and uh, a housing applicant. Uh, so it's a text-based scripted uh, conversation um, and you will watch the, the player go through a set of challenges um, and uh, the outcome is that the technology takes decisions about the housing application. Right, so, yeah. Yeah, because the game that you designed is uh, um, actually you you pretend to be a, a housing association or somebody who gives away houses in the city and you lure people into entering an application process. Yes. Right. And then when they do that, then this happens. And here's the video. Wow. Well, that was um, a walkthrough of, uh, of Alain Normal. Um, we would have to say that uh, at the moment this is still a prototype. Uh, the, the actual game uh, um, uh, is, is sort of a, a big step still to develop because that requires probably a lot of uh, work because the game is based on an artificial intelligence uh, agent that operates with uh, somebody who sort of walks through the city and decides that he wants to join this housing corporation. And we see this conversation starting between the artificial intelligence and what I like about it is it's become slightly, it becomes creepier and creepier, right? It asks you sort of some regular questions first, but then, you know, it starts showing you pictures of families and it does yeah. facial recognition. And so it's trying to get a feel of your own assumptions, your prejudice uh, towards different things, um, your, uh, your own aspirations in terms of your dreams, uh, but also uses uh, data somehow, like your birthday, to, to make its own assumptions about you. 
Um, and it, it's trying to make this profile of you based on different uh, data points. And then according to that, it, it creates uh, this profile that it responds and either rejects or accepts. Right. And that is, of course, something that's happening to us uh, all the time, right? When we're on Facebook or Google or uh, uh, everywhere, data is being collected about us and we're getting fat kind of advertisements, etc. Um, here you took that principle and you exaggerated it. Yes, this is uh, one of the basic uh, principles that we try to, to work with, um, having this uh, parafiction aspect of the game, of blending uh, reality, so things that actually happen uh, in our lives now, uh, with more of a hyper-real kind of uh, experiences, um, and blending the, this understanding of where, where is reality, you know? How, how much of this is it actually real? And if it's too close to our reality now, why is it shocking yeah. still? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, let's talk about that in a minute. But first you have to explain the title to me, Alain Normal. Uh, so it's, a, as you said also, it's a, a Dutch uh, expression. Uh, it means only normal. And um, this, of course, in the Netherlands had uh, a political statement to it. Um, uh, but this, I think, is a very, um, it's an expression that is used in different cultures and different languages as well. Um, this concept of acting normal, not deviating from the average behavior or what is considered average behavior. Um, but of course, this is very different according to who you're speaking with. Um, so, uh, based on that, we aimed to really question these kind of um, what, what is normal, what is normality, what do we accept, um, and really uh, at the same time question all these assumptions and prejudices in the city, um, and also the role of technology nowadays being the, the one that determines what is right and what is wrong. Right, technology as the judge of, well, yes. of what, is, what is normal. Um, for those who are not from the Netherlands, uh, in the, the last picture in the little movie was our prime minister, Mr. Rutte. Why, why was he there? Uh, so th this uh, debate originated in the Netherlands uh, when uh, there was a, um, a bit this influx of immigrants and uh, the prime minister had that as its political slogan of um, we accept immigrants but only if they act normal. Um, so, uh, and as I said, I think this is a very uh, local but also global uh, statement uh, of people accepting or not accepting others uh, coming in their country but also um, in their daily life as friends. Uh, so, um, yeah, this is the, the local, let's say, reference to it. Right. Yeah. Um, let's get back to the, to the game itself eh, and the, where the, the, um, the experience of it. Um, you already mentioned you called it parafiction. Can you sort of explain that again? What exactly you mean with that? Um, so, uh, as I said, parafiction is this blend of the real and the hyper real. Um, and what we tried to do is to use also some uh, theatrical uh, aspect uh, and principles, like the as if uh, principle of theater. Um, the as if principle of theater, can you explain that? Uh, so creating uh, a stage uh, with a, a parallel reality, um, a, a different kind of reality, um, where you create all these conditions for people to believe that this is uh, real. Um, but then uh, parafiction, how it works with that, is that it's trying to reference very real phenomena. Um, and in the end, you are, as a player, our goal was to be left kind of confused on what what is really um, real and what is not and right, how, how close right. is yeah, it. Yeah, you, you're referring to this as if uh, trend in theater, right, where theater makers are sort of leaving the black box of the theater itself and they're staging experiences in the city. I think in the Netherlands, Dries Verhoeven is one of the, the, the most well-known examples of that. Uh, and as, as uh, somebody who's walking through the city, you sort of walk by and you're confronted with that, but you're not really sure whether it's it's, you yeah. know, it, it looks like yeah. normal, but there is something strange to it, yes. right? And we try to blend this with the magic circle of the game. Um, so w when you step into the game, you step into this reality, like theatrical performance almost, uh, that you are actually a part of it as well. Right. But people who, who will play this game, do they know it's a game or do they think that they're actually applying for uh, a housing 
Uh, so we, this was a big discussion in the process of developing the game. Uh, we started by um, having this on a real website, like funda.nl in the Netherlands, which is a housing uh, website. Um, then we moved to social media, kind of making it really a game on Facebook, for example. And then in the end, we moved to having it as a standalone kind of app or game. Um, I think uh, all these three would be plausible paths that you, you, would, you could go through. Uh, at the moment, it's something that they know is a game. Uh, so we would need to further develop, of course, the concept to see where these paths would lead us. Uh, but they, they would be aware that they are entering a game. Yeah. Um, uh, you developed the game also, of course, in uh, in times of, of COVID. I think if I remember discussions we had in, in the beginning that this was actually going to be experienced in public space as well. Yeah. Um, can you say a bit more about that? How, how did you start this being an urban game? Um, so we, um, we, we were discussing how can this be... Uh, related to a site, uh, a construction site of a potential building that is getting built in an area um, in Amsterdam, uh, but also anywhere else really. Uh, we discussed uh, about having um, like a kiosk of like community engagement kind of um, experience that you are asked to, um, to give your feedback for something about this development that is getting built, but also to get you excited about this new development. So if you want to be part of it and you want to apply, uh, then you would go through the experience. Um, and something that we really wanted to uh, to reference is the the phenomena of um, gentrification in the city. So we, we worked also in an area where um, th there was this phenomenon that was uh, going on really, um, and we wanted to to see how this game uh, could reflect these things that actually happen in our cities, like segregation, gentrification, uh, people that um, want to live somewhere but they can't. Uh, and the, the determining factor these days are like economical factors or developers that take this decision for you. Um, so why is it really shocking that technology could be actually taking this decision for people? Um, yeah. Yeah. Right. And the game is a way for you to sort of address all these all these themes uh, originally in the city, but of course that well we had to pause that idea because of the situation. Now it's going to be an online uh, app. Um, if you look back at the whole process, uh, we started saying that you're an architect and you wanted to understand better, uh, yeah, orchestrating the dynamics of public space. What have you learned from this whole trajectory? Uh, or what kind of insight has stuck with you? Yeah. I think um, seeing people as as a citizen all, or, and a user of physical space, but also of digital services. Um, so I think as architects, it's uh, limiting and it um, doesn't make sense to me to keep blind to all these developments and the differences and the augmented cities that we, we will experience or we are experiencing um, already. Uh, and I think the tools of the architect have also to change uh, from designing you know, buildings to services, experiences. Uh, and how, when you start to look at the citizen um, as a user, uh, how do you interact with them? Um, and gamification, of course, is a tool uh, that we can use. Um, yeah, but maybe not exactly in the way that you've proposed it uh, in this game, right? Yeah, yeah, but it was uh, the whole experience. It was very informative because, of course, we had all these uh, different influences from other games, game designers, people. So uh, this interaction layer between the city and the citizen was, I think, a big insight for me. Okay. Uh, thanks, Olina. Uh, the game cannot be played yet, but hopefully in the future. So stay tuned. Uh, watch the uh, keep keep a watch on the website of the the program here, and we'll uh, update it. Uh, thank you for uh, yeah showing us Alain Normal. Thank you, Olina. Thank you very much. And then I'd like to introduce our last uh, speaker. Uh, we've had the three games uh, right now uh, from the participants in the uh, European 
School of Urban Game Design, the Amsterdam branch. Um, to close off the discussion, I'd like to invite uh, my uh, collaborator in organi organizing the Amsterdam branch, uh, Gabriella Ferry. Gabriella, you're a colleague, you're a design mm -hmm. researcher. Uh, you're also the head of the Master Digital Design at the Amsterdam University of uh, Applied Sciences. Um, why is a person like you interested in urban game design? Because it's fun. <laughs> because uh, if you, I mean, it's really good to see the both sides of design research, uh, because maybe we spend uh, uh, days uh, locked in our offices of writing things and researching things, and sometimes it's nice to just go out there and, and, and make something that uh, interacts with people and make them uh, connect in, in, in unexpected ways. Uh, and I think it's really, uh, in a sense, it's really uh, challenging in, in the best possible way to, to to try and come up with uh, ways in which uh, people are uh, drawn out of their comfort zone and brought to uh, to interact in ways that we are not maybe uh, imagining. It's in a way, it's it's a matter of finding the right level of uh, uh, of ambiguity in the kind of rules that we give to them, and this is really. Um, in a sense, it's really a refreshing luxury uh, after spending uh, a lot of time doing maybe other types of design, uh, playing with this more open-ended and provocative aspects. Right, and uh, that's that's why as a design, you're, mm -hmm. you're interested in sort of the design process mm -hmm. itself and yep. looking into that. But why urban games? What is the potential of urban games for you? Well, I, I really think, I mean, there is nothing more concrete. Oh, well, there are very few things that are more concrete than a city. You know, think about the the, the inhabitants of the city and all the things that happen in cities. Uh, and uh, if we can be playful and we can use uh, game mechanics and rules and, and dynamics and so on and so forth to, uh, to actually have an effect on this really, really complex uh, fabric uh, that, are, that are cities. Uh, I mean, that is something that is so incredibly powerful and yet uh, not uh, as direct as other type of designs. And this is the thing that I really find um, interesting. Can you give an example of what you mean? Yeah, well, look, uh, think about what, uh, what Lily was saying uh, a, a few minutes ago. I mean, uh, they made a game that can prompt uh, somebody uh, to go into a small record store and sort of making a, a, a stream of consciousness of what he or she uh, is doing. Um, first of all, it's an incredible uh, kind of power that we need to learn uh, to exercise for good in a certain way. Uh, and also, it's a really nice way of, like I was saying, uh, of drawing people out of their shell, uh, so to say. Uh, and if we connect back to the theme of trust, because this project was about trust, um, I mean, it takes a lot of trust in, in the social fabric around you to, to do uh, some of the things that uh, our games ask their players uh, to do. And I find it really, really cool yeah. to be. To and I think one of, one of the interesting things about urban games is also that uh, usually if you play a game, mm -hmm. you step into the magic circle, mm -hmm. as been mentioned mm -hmm. already uh, before today. Sort of it's a separate arena, you have separate rules, mm -hmm. uh, you, can do cra you can do sort of crazy mm -hmm. stuff because it's okay, you're in this yep. game. But when you play an urban game, um, this magic circle is always a bit amb ambiguous, yeah. right? Um, the people around you, they don't really know whether yeah. you are playing a game yeah. or not. So all these new interesting interactions start to happen. Did, yeah. you, did, you, did, did, did you see that happen during the process that we went through in the last year? Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, to begin with, the idea of the magic circle is, of course, debated and debatable in many, in many ways. Uh, but I mean, imagine, I, I, I'm thinking about uh, the, the, the small experiments that we were making throughout the design process. Uh, at some point, uh, we and all the talented designers that we were working with, uh, we decided that uh, it would be nice to just go on a sidewalk uh, and just literally try to act in particular ways and see what what comes out of that. Uh, and just the, the, I don't know, the, the act of walking backwards uh, in public uh, on a real sidewalk in a real city, uh, at the very least, uh, makes uh, all sorts of kids point at you and, 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 and smile and laugh. Uh, and that's the moment in which you say, oh, there might be a game uh, in, in, in this. Uh, and at the same time, if you want to be a bit more philosophical, I mean, are you in a game 
in that moment? Are you being playful in that moment? Are you just being playing stupid in that moment? Uh, you know, the, 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 the boundary between these things is sometimes uh, um, porous and, and, and permeable. Uh, and I think that this is, again, another of the beauties of doing games in public spaces. Uh, you never know where the game ends, and you never know where the city begins. Probably they, they are overlapping. Right. Um, and we've all already discussed this a few times in the mm -hmm. previous conversations, uh, but doing that mm -hmm. uh, actually requires people from different disciplines uh, yeah. coming together. Uh, uh, for us as researchers, mm -hmm. uh, also that was really interesting to mm -hmm. see what kind mm -hmm. of yeah. dynamic emerged. Uh, uh, we've worked with these people for, for a year. What has stuck with you? What, what sort of surprised you in the way that the whole design process took shape? Well, look, there are at least two things. Uh, the first one maybe is, is for uh, academic geeks like us, but uh, they, they, they talk a lot. Uh, our designers spent a lot of time discussing, which is bizarre because in, in, in class, uh, when, I, when I teach design, uh, at some point I have to say, okay, guys, uh, let's stop uh, discussing. At, at some point we need to start making. Uh, so what these people did is, in, a, in many ways, counter counterintuitive. And yet, uh, they produced uh, stuff that is really, really cool. So there must be something good there. My idea is that uh, working with a group that is so diverse, so heterogeneous, uh, really required a lot of um, foundation building and a lot of self-reflection. And my hypothesis, from what I've seen, uh, is that these people uh, instinctively uh, tended to uh, looping back and check and recheck if they were always on the on the on the same page and this is really interesting in the context of design processes and then uh, if i if i if i think about uh, the ways in which the group operated uh, you really see the differences between or you really see some differences uh, between uh, disciplinary backgrounds so uh, you see people that are more experienced in making games so under the umbrella of game design uh, that tend to focus on exactly what is between the beginning and the end of the game um, and sort of leave the context a little bit in the background and on the other way around you see people that are more trained in architecture and things that are uh, uh, more context dependent uh, that really uh, were pushing to make sure that whatever they designed uh, was really fitting in the uh, space and place and time uh, of, uh, of where they were supposed to, to go. And this was a really interesting tension that was, I would say, successfully resolved uh, by our uh, participants, uh, but really in many ways stresses uh, the diversity and the, the breadth of what we call design, because it's all under the same umbrella, uh, but there are a lot of different dialects, and it's super fascinating to look at all the differences there. Right, and then to make it more complicated, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the assignment was also to address the theme of trust uh, yes. in, in the games. Um, according to you, I mean, w w how can games or playful experience, how can they contribute to trust in cities? Well, look, uh, as I was saying before, the moment in which you allow yourself to play, uh, inherently you allow yourself to be uh, silly and a bit more than silly. Uh, and so, I mean, that's part, that's part of the game, right? You cannot play something and being extremely serious unless you're playing Russian roulette, and we certainly don't want that. Um, so uh, if, you, if you allow people to, uh, to be silly and to be anomalous, to be different, in, in, in public spaces. Um, I would say that you are also making the case uh, for uh, being a bit more tolerant. Uh, a little bit what Olina was saying with the, with, with the last concept. Uh, you are making a comment, you're making a statement about the diversity of the possible behaviors in, 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 in public spaces. Um, so in a dream, uh, I could say that maybe in 20 years, uh, urban games become again so popular that when I see somebody behaving in a weird way down the road, uh, uh, people would not have the uh, 
knee-jerk reaction of calling the cops, uh, but might, they might assume that this is just somebody having fun. And yeah, that's let's totally join in. Hmm? Yeah, let's join in. You know, yeah, let's, let's do that. Yeah, happen, absolutely. Right? Um, what you're saying, it reminds me a bit of, uh, of urban theory, of public mm -hmm. space, right? Yeah. Where trust is built. Mm -hmm. Jane Jacobs mm -hmm. has mm -hmm. written a lot about this, of mm -hmm. course, uh, through sort of all these small interactions mm -hmm. that you have, right? That in, in themselves are not meaningful. It's sort of the small talk. It's sort of the chance meetings uh, and games could sort of contribute to uh, to that, if I if I hear you right, yeah, yeah um, At the same time, um, we have been talking about playfulness and games, mm -hmm. but uh, if you look at what's happening in in cities as a large, uh, there is also this tendency of gamification, mm -hmm. right? Where yeah. everyday kind of uh, practices are being turned into games, and you can earn points and mm -hmm. badges, and that can feed mm -hmm. into a reputation system. Um, do you think that's an interesting way also to build trust in cities? Well, look, that is a way that is becoming, unfortunately, almost mainstream. Uh, although I think that recently gamification has become a bit of a dirty word that we try not to use. Uh, the idea is that uh, if you make everything a point, a badge that you can that you can receive, uh, of course, it, beca it it makes it very easy for somebody who is not maybe an experienced game designer to uh, turn everything into a basic uh, game. Uh, but it also has the possible downside of uh, 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 enabling uh, systems that can become systems of, systems of control, of surveillance, because if I pointify, if I quantify uh, everything, then as a consequence, I count uh, how many people, how many, how many people go in one direction, how many times somebody takes a shower, how many times somebody shakes hand. I mean, that can become uh, yeah, not good. I hear what you see. Right? If we look at uh, the games that we've sold today, mm -hmm. they were really open. Right? Yes. People could, uh, yes. could sort of make up their own rules. They could sort of step in. They could step out. Yeah. Whereas such a gamification is much more regimented. Exactly. Right? It's sort of exactly. really, you're more, it's more that you're being played than, exactly. that, you're, than exactly. that you're playing. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And this really loops back and maybe brings us to a conclusion, loops back to what I was saying in the beginning. I think that urban game and, 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 and urban game design are powerful because of their open-endedness, as you said, uh, because of their ambiguity. Uh, I agree with you, also the small interactions uh, between passersby are super important. Uh, and it's almost as if they were the condensed version of a lot of really crucial social dynamics uh, made in a in a playable form. How cool is that? <laughs> oh, that's very cool. Um, and I think uh, mm -hmm. that's also an excellent uh, ending of this conversation. Uh, urban games uh, can sort of mm -hmm. contribute to all that in the city. And yes, the indeed. urban game designer, if that ever is a profession, uh, is somebody who could sort of uh, yeah become a choreographer of public space, uh, as we've sometimes uh, called it. And we definitely need something like this. And we definitely need them. Okay. Uh, thank you, Gabriella Thanks. Ferry. Uh, thank you, all the participants of the Trust in Play Amsterdam branch European School of Urban Game Design. This was it. Uh, we hope you uh, enjoyed the program and uh, stay tuned um, because Pakhuis de Zwijger will have many more interesting programs uh, in the coming days and weeks. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.